the 1991 Persian Gulf War constituted a milestone in the mediatization of war. Around 1,600 hand-picked British, French and American reporters were placed in a tent city with US forces in the Saudi desert. In addition, journalists were based on battleships and aircraft carriers, and the Iraqi government had granted a handful of reporters access to a Baghdad hotel from which CNN issued live broadcasts. These centralized points of access to the war necessitated very little overt censorship on part of the Pentagon. Most journalists were stuck in the desert, close to military officials, but far from the action. And even in the first Gulf War, uh, you saw uh, the press being very, very controlled, not being allowed in certain areas, and what they were allowed to report was highly structured, which meant that in some of the greatest battles in, world, in the uh, first Gulf War, the great tank battle across the desert, one of the greatest military victories of all time, an almost impossible feat, there's almost no documentation of it because no reporters were allowed to go on that battle. Keeping journalists far from the military action was also helped by the nature of the war itself. For the first four weeks, this was a massive bombing campaign from the air. And by the time the ground operation finally kicked in, the war was over within a mere hundred hours. Pooled reporters therefore barely saw any action or were deliberately held from any discernible action. Many journalists therefore referred to the pool system as censorship by lack of access. Moreover, the reporter who deviated from the official storyline would risk losing access to what had been the reporter's bread and butter. The steady stream of war programming and footage that was issued by the military's PR apparatus. And reporters knew that their content had to be reviewed by military PR staff before it could be relayed back home via military satellites. This according to David Campbell, gave the military political and structural power to significantly delay the transmission of news. So you go back to the Gulf War in 1990-91, that's the pool system where you get a sample of journalists, a sample of camera crews, a sample of photographers selected each day or periodically to then go with military units or, or whatever to certain parts of, of the conflict and so on and then provide those images generally for the, for the media constituency at large which of course many of the media didn't like because of the, of the time that took the delay in getting the images back then making the selection then not having control over those, those sorts of things and in one account of that, that, that pool system because there were also uh, moments in which uh, military officials wanted to review the sort of coverage, uh, people concluded that actually it was taking longer to get the image from the front line through the system, through the military uh, um, censorship controls, out to the public. It, that was taking longer than in the American Civil War in the 19th century for something to actually reach the public. On average, it took two to three days for any footage or news story to be transmitted. Something that pooled reporters started dubbing censorship by delay. After all, old news are no news. For journalists, operating within these constraints and wanting to avoid any censorship by delay had the effect that they engaged in heavy self-censorship. On only four occasions did Pentagon staff not approve of a news report during the entire conflict. Now that is a stunning figure, given that 1,600 reporters were covering five weeks of conflict 24-7. This meant that the pooled press assumed the role of stenographer for military public relations even sharing misinformation and black propaganda aimed at enemy ranks. Both sides, the Pentagon and the press, fared well under these conditions. For the Pentagon, the relationship ensured a near monopoly of the news cycles in both agenda setting and language being used. For journalists, the system provided compelling footage, access to officials,
updates, human interest stories for free and at virtually no human risk. This symbiosis was enormously successful in meeting the needs of corporate news. It transformed 24-hour cable news from a failing idea into a resounding commercial success. In the case of CNN, for instance, the war coverage boosted its audience figures by a factor of 10. In other words, war reporting became a financially lucrative business. This phenomenon is reflected in the rates charged for TV advertisement. The most expensive time to place advertisement on U.S. television occurs during the Super Bowl and during the live coverage of U.S. wars. These structures allowed the military to deliver a war that both satisfied its public relations interest and that remained television friendly. They maximized television's potential as a spectacular medium. One capable of packaging not just a contained war, but a compelling real-time main event. A drama screen production that allowed a global viewership to watch war while eating dinner. A war digestible, consumable, even amusing and breathtaking for the new spectator citizen. There were a number of key features that made the 1991 Iraq war so consumable and breathtaking to Western audiences. First and foremost, the human body, especially the dead body, disappeared from the screen. The war was marked by a distinct lack of imagery of dead American soldiers as well as dead Iraqi civilians. Prior to the war, Orders had been given by President Bush not to show dead bodies. As a result, the war appeared to be bloodless and clean. I think you could call the dominant aesthetic of the first Gulf War in 1991 uh, the clean war, because there was sort of an abstraction of the body from the image of war on the screen. You don't have dead soldiers, dead civilians, um, even in a limited way as you did in Vietnam. Um, instead, you have uh, a drama of military machinery. And instead of the language of death or the language of suffering, the language of violence even, um, you have a kind of clinical language of um, medical surgery. And you have the abstraction of the uh, enemy uh, soldiers into what some scholars have called um, the machine colossus. So you have, you know, the language of, you know, uh, heads to be decapitated or eyes to be put out or, um, you know, taking away uh, uh, Saddam Hussein's mobility um, or something like that. Um, you have this kind of war against not people, not soldiers, not civilians, but a war against a machine, which takes all the moral culpability out of the process of violence and, again, makes for a very easy consumable experience on the home front. The image and the rhetoric of clean war was coupled with a new form of techno-fetishism, a focus on military marvels that was placed center stage for Western consumption. Another strand that comes in and out in different ways is of course the focus on the technology of war itself and the actual fighting machines. But if you think of the Gulf War in 1991, that was a distinctive moment because we got to see the cameras on the nose of the missile right up until the point of impact on the target. And that's the sense of the high sophisticated, technologically advanced, quote, surgical form of conflict. What we don't get to see throughout all that, or what is managed in a very particular way, is of course the consequence of fighting and you know the casualties, the deaths um, of the soldiers, uh, as well as of the enemy and of the civilians. It produced a form of military coverage which was highly sanitized, where the consequence of war occupies far less of the coverage than it does in the actual practice of war. Uh, Technofetishism is a complex word to describe a very simple phenomenon of moving the drama of war from the soldier hero to the weapon system itself. 
And this is another step in abstracting the war and cleansing the war of the imagery of death, bodies, and suffering. So if the war is mainly about machines in contest with one another, then you don't have to think about death. You don't have to think about mothers giving birth in the middle of war zones, right? It's just another way of turning a unconsumable war into something that you wouldn't mind watching over dinner. Technofetishism and the focus on military marvels significantly tainted the viewer's perception of the nature of the war. The repeated replay of bombs I views from the nose of smart missiles obscured the fact that only 8% of all the bombs dropped on Iraq were actually smart bombs. And it shielded the citizen spectator from the consequences of the war itself. This high-technology war, the media coverage suggested, was a clean war. Making the dead disappear, placing the emphasis on smart weapons and precision bombing, celebrating the marvels of technology and linguistically mobilizing an army of euphemisms made the 1991 Persian Gulf War consumable. Taken together, they turned war into a spectacle for the citizen spectator. They enabled the military to package the war as humane and surgical and devoid of bloodletting, factors that are regarded as central in the eyes of military planners to create and sustain legitimacy for warfare in the eyes of the public. And it packaged the war in such a spectacular fashion that it had an anesthetizing effect whereby the viewer tunes in in order to tune out. This, according to Roger Stahl, is what makes the spectacle distinct from the conventional notion of propaganda. When we think about classical propaganda, like in World War I or World War II, we generally think about it in terms of films like the Frank Capra series, Why We Fight, or propaganda posters. And these are, these are media that address the citizen as a person who makes logical decisions and is asking that citizen to make sacrifices to decide whether or not is, this is a conflict worth supporting, right? It makes a case, it's persuasive. Whereas the kind of propaganda that we are likely to encounter um, today, starting with the first Gulf War, is of a more subtle variety. It presumes that we are disconnected already. And it um, is in the business of creating a spectacle that is not likely to engender citizen activism or a sense that um, a war needs to be authorized or debated or deliberated about. Um, instead, it presents a war that is already in progress and um, a war that only requires us to sit back, watch, and consume uh, in a very private way. The 1991 Gulf War was a war that asked the citizen back home and across the world to sit back and marvel at the glorious machine in motion, to be entertained by a festival of fireworks, asking no more of the citizen than a ball game or an action movie. War as a spectacle appears like spectator sport warfare. Fifteen years after Vietnam, and 15 years after experimenting how to positively channel democratic media as an integral part of warfighting, the Pentagon had finally found and institutionalized a new model for war's mediatization. And it generated a sense of relief across the political and military elites in Washington, D.C. This was perhaps best reflected by President George Herbert Walker Bush declaring in his victory speech that, by God, we've kicked the Vietnam syndrome once and for all. The democratic media was still seen as the potential enemy within. But now at least, this new form of clean and all-consuming war no longer allowed the media to rear its ugly head.